And you're one of the happiest people I've ever met. I mean, all we do together is just laugh and laugh and laugh. <laughs> and it's, it's the best thing ever. And, you know, you think you'd be kind of a serious dude. You know, you did all these super heroic things and you're focused and you can do anything. But, it, you know, I think your, your mental attitude determines so much about the quality of your life. And, and it really, you know, I think for you, uh, I'd like to hear how you sort of got to this place. Because I know when you started out uh, on that journey, uh, particularly in Antarctica, you were really worried. You didn't think you could do it. You were scared. You doubted yourself. You didn't think you'd make the first point, uh, the waypoint, and, and doubted you could get across the finish line. So, you know, I know you, you told the story in, in an article when we were there together about how you called your wife. And, and what, what did your wife, Jenna, what did, what did she say to you? What was the advice she gave? And how did she inspire you to not just finish that first day, but finish the 54 days? Yeah, no, absolutely. That, those are all great questions. Um, you know, we'll get back to the book, but the book is really framed from some of this wisdom, which is, I don't care who you are, if, you, if you've walked across a continent, if you haven't, whatever, you know, rich, poor, young, old, doesn't matter. As human beings, all of us are, are living this, this crazy human experiment, right? And we have limiting beliefs, we have doubts, we have fears, like that's part of the, the human existence, right? But also understanding how to react um, to those things. That very first day, as you mentioned, I, I got out of the plane. Lou got out of the plane. He took off and I couldn't pull my sled. It was 375 pounds. I, obviously, I trained my body as best as I could, thought I was ready. And I started pulling my sled. I could pull it like 10 feet at a time. And it was wow. so pathetic that I actually started crying. I started bawling, oh. crying. Um, and if you want to know the most pathetic, crying by yourself is not a great feeling. Um, but it's minus 30 outside, keep in mind, because I'm on the edges of Antarctica. And so that the tears, they start actually freezing Freeze. to my face, <laughs> which is, <laughs> it, it, it thought you feel pathetic, but you know, you can't start this race and you've got frozen tears on your face. You're like, wow, this is just going from bad to worse. This is hour one, day one. You know, this, I thought I might fail 30 days, 40 days in this expedition, but this is right out of the gate. Um, mm. and I, ca I called my wife, uh, I had a stat phone. She was the only person that talked when I was out there. Um, and I called her and she, of course, was like, you know, sh she's not just my wife, but she is a, a co-dreamer, co-conspirator, business partner. She's dreamed up and helped me build all these expeditions um, and all of our businesses mm -hmm. that we've done it all together. Um, so she's really in the weeds with, with all the details of this, but she's like, why are you calling me so soon? Um, and I was like, well, we, we had <laughs> called our project The Impossible First. It's the name of my, my previous book, The Impossible First, uh, name, of the, name of the project. And she goes, I, well, I go, I think we may have named our project the right thing. This appears to be impossible. She's like, what are you talking about? And I said, uh, I can't even pull my sled like the first mile. Forget 932 miles. Lou's gone beyond the horizon. And she kind of said to me in that moment, and there was many other moments where she kind of had to pull me back on track, but she said to me, hey, look, forget about Lou. Forget about the thousand miles. Forget about the race get to the next waypoint, get to the first waypoint. So I had a GPS that had kind of markings mm -hmm. on the path. And she just said, forget about the totality of how hard this ridiculous thing is you're trying. Make some incremental step, make some incremental process. Um, and, and I got there the, the following morning, I, I wake up, she's like, and then the next morning, see if you can get to the next waypoint. I wake up in my tent the very first morning after crying frozen tears on my cheeks. And <laughs> I, I, I joke because I say, well, who was in the tent with me? And people are like, wait, did Lou come back? No, no, Lou wasn't there. Who was there with me was all of the negative versions of myself sitting around in the tent with me. Colin, you're such an idiot. You're so stupid. You're not strong enough. You're a failure, right? They're beating up on myself, just being yeah. very hard on myself. Mm -hmm. But I also believe that we are the stories that we tell ourselves, right? And so I actually stood up outside of my tent and I yelled to try to cut through the negative noise in my brain. I started yelling, Colin, you are strong. You are capable. You are strong. Mm, you are capable. Mm. Really trying to uplift myself. Look, it, it's not like I just shot to the lead or anything like that, but it gave me enough kind of strength and courage to rewrite some of this negative self-talk and get out of my tent. And I told Jenna before that 10 hours was my absolute maximum. Like I couldn't possibly go further than 10 hours um, in a single day, but I caught up to Lou on the sixth day and we ended up side mm. by side, shoulder to shoulder. Um, and he starts trying to talk to me. He starts trying to chat me up. Like, he's like, Hey, uh, is he trash talking you or what? <laughs> he's, he's, well, he's trying to do it all nice. Like he's trying to say like, Hey, I, I got a little advice for you. I got a little this. I'm like, well, what, what are you talking about? Uh -huh. I finally say, Hey Lou, let this be the last time we speak. I got, it, it's nothing negative. I don't wish you any ill will, but we're supposed to be out here alone. And this is a race. 
And so he kind of says, suit yourself. And I say like, I'll see you later. But we're both pulling 300 plus pounds behind us. Like, see you later. Like we both are moving like, you know, one step every you know few seconds. Like you can't just race away from somebody. So I end up shoulder to shoulder with him for eight hours, nine hours, wow. 10 hours. We're still wow. right next to each other. And 10 hours goes by my absolute, what I told myself was my maximum. And he doesn't stop. So I go, I got to go one more hour further, 11 hours. I finally see him reach for his tent and I pretend like I'm not exhausted, even though I am, but I go for one more hour, 12 hours beyond what I ever thought I could possibly do. And then it resets what I believe I'm capable of. I'm like, wow, if I can go 12 hours once, can I go it twice? Can I go it three times? And then that 12 hours ends up being its its own kind of new norm. But it uh, brings it full circle. We've been talking a lot about sort of this feed or this thing that I did. Um, I wrote a book about it a couple of years called The Impossible First, a New York Times bestseller. Proud, proud of that, recounts the whole story. But what I was most excited to do with this new book is I take what I had learned and apply it in a way that any single person is passionate about. As passionate as I am about following my own journey, you know, taking on these yeah. adventures, what I'm most passionate about is inspiring everyone to what I, the question I like to ask is, what's your Everest? What's a fulfilled life look for you? What mm. are you passionate about? How can you live your best life? Um, because I think we're all capable of that. And look, m- for most people, that doesn't look like freezing their ass off and walking across Antarctica by themselves, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, but yeah. just totally fine. It, I'm not trying to inspire people to do that. So I found, and, and I, 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 it means a lot to me as a friend and someone who I highly regard for you to say that I'm the happiest person you met, uh, one of the happiest people you know. Um, the end of the, at the end of that story, the end of that first book, the chapter is called Infinite Love. Um, yeah. it, it wasn't called, hey, I'd cross Antarctica and no one done it. Let me beat my chest and oh, I'm so cool yeah. or badass. Because what I ended up connected to out there was Source was energy, yeah. was the universe. I mean, call it whatever you want. Call it God, call it the universe, call it energy. For me, I call it infinite love. But when all the other external was pushed aside, um, the the pressure, the accolades, the feet, whatever, what I just was left with was just pure love. I could feel the love of my wife, the love of my family, the love of um, the kids I hope to inspire with my work uh, in the schools, the, you know, just the love of humanity. Um, and that's, that, that's how I reflect at the end of, of that book. And so I found this inner peace and I should say that I deleted all my music, all my podcasts, all the things uh-huh. I actually spent those 54 days basically yeah. in silence inside my own brain. Wow. That's quite amazing. So the thing that's interesting is that I thought that I had kind of cracked the code, right? I get to the end of this, I achieve this thing, a lot of external praise, but more than anything, I found this place inside my body, right? That was just peaceful. And for a year or so, things are feeling good. And then COVID hits. You know, Mm. we all remember March of 2020, COVID hits. I had some expeditions planned. I was on book tour at the time. Everything's canceled. Future's uncertain. Doom scroll in the news. You know, hundreds and then thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are dying. Just like negative, negative. Yeah. And I end up sitting in my house. My my family has a, a cabin on the Oregon coast. My wife and my dog, we went out there, just, I mean, me and my wife basically with our dog, Jack, sitting on the Oregon coast. And I just was depressed, man. I was went into mm-hmm. a deep anxiety, depression, feeling bad, really feeling adrift. Um, and so I thought back to myself, what was the last time that I felt really at peace? When, when did mm. I when did I feel at mm. peace last? And I thought to myself, you know, this is so weird, but I actually felt at peace, starving, but being alone, walking across Antarctica 12 hours a day. So I said to my wife, I said, this might sound ridiculous, but I'm, I mean, I hadn't changed out of my pajamas in like three days. I mean, just sitting there like staring, you know, staring at the wall, like just feeling yeah. down. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of people felt that throughout the, the isolation of that time. Right. Um, and so I said, I'm, I'm going to go for a walk tomorrow all day long. And she's like, what are you Mm. talking about? I said, I'm going for a 12 hour walk, just like I did in Antarctica. But instead I'm going to walk out my front door here on the Oregon coast. And when I came back, I I actually walked out the door 20 minutes in. I remember my phone buzzes, my phone buzzes. And I grabbed my phone instinctively to like check who's texting me or whatever. And I stopped myself. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? I've been, you know, zoom calling family, doom scroll on the news, checking social media. Like I don't need my phone today. And so I put my phone on airplane mode. I didn't bring podcasts with me. I didn't bring music. And I ended up walking for 12 hours alone yeah. on the Oregon coast. Mm. And when I came back through that door, my wife looked at me and she was like, just without, before I even spoke, she's like, 
I can just tell in your essence and in, in your presence that something has shifted within you. How was that yeah. walk? And I said, I feel better than I have felt definitely since this pandemic started. So forgive the long explanation, but the long story short is I thought, well, this is a great for me. I can tap back into that energy because I put in the work in Antarctica, whatever, but I wonder if this works for other people. And so I started suggesting yeah. this to friends and family member, people who are also going through some tough times or feeling stuck during the pandemic try to take this 12 hour walk. And I said, look, people are like, I can't walk for that long. I said, I don't care if you walk for one mile or 50. I, it's not, you have to train for this. This is, this is not some physical feat. Take as many breaks as you want, sit down, but stay in silence a day by yourself just to reflect. Mm. Mm. And it has been resoundingly positive. Um, and so this book, this book has all sorts of stuff in it, rich adventure stories from rowing a boat across Drake Passage to Everest with my wife, to losing friends on K2, to Antarctica, et cetera, keeps you excited, edge of your seat storytelling, and some prescriptive advice about how to get over limiting beliefs. But at its core, at its true core, to me, this is more than a book. It's really a global movement. It's a call to action yeah. to invite people to take one day, put it on their calendar, and take a 12-hour walk. Um, and it's amazing what I've seen and I'm excited. My, my next ever is to inspire 10 million people to take this walk. Um, and I think that the, the, I already know how powerful it can be. It, it's not to vilify technology or to say, live as a monk the rest of your life. It's saying, Hey, take one day, take one day yeah. and take this, commit to this. And it will have a massive shift on your mental health, your ability to move forward and the ability to really unlock your best life on the other side. It's so beautiful, Colin. I, you know, I, I, I just want to pause there because, you know, it's not about climbing the tallest peak on every continent, which is a heroic feat. It's not about the external feats of crossing Antarctica and doing things that no one else has done. It's about the feat of conquering your own mind and figuring out how to connect to what really matters. And I certainly have not climbed Mount Everest. I have not rode across the Drake Passage, nor have I done anything other than slide down a hill with you in Antarctica mm -hmm. <laughs> and giggling a lot. But what I did do, and I, I, I kind of um, did it because I felt the onrush of my life taking me away from what really mattered to me and, and feeling in some ways disconnected from myself uh, through all the external activities of life that we all do. And, and, I, and I've been on a mission for the last 30 years climbing a little bit of a different mountain, which is transforming medicine based on understanding so much needless suffering and how to heal people through functional medicine. And I decided to give myself a timeout. And I went to a cabin in Vermont at the base of a mountain, not at the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. And I had a bed. It was kind of warm and comfy. But I did exactly the same thing. I didn't walk, but I, I sat with myself for 30 days. Wow. And I had no media, no computer, no phone, no work, no email, no podcast. And I was with myself and my own thoughts and my own experience. And I'm the kind of guy who typically fills up my day morning to night with activities and productivity. And I'm really, you know, I get so much done. And, you know, today I, I'm, I'm embarrassed about it. Like I did, you know, two podcasts, saw tons of patients, you know, cleaned up my whole house, did this and that, went for a bike ride. You know, it's like my <laughs> average day. But, but it was the most transformative thing I've ever done. It wasn't a 12 hour walk, although I did walk every day for hours. It was just sitting with myself and being with myself. And, and at first it was scary and it was threatening and I was uncomfortable and I was restless and, and I was looking for some distraction. Uh, and then I finally settled into it and I got to exactly the same place that you did. I got to this place. Uh, I didn't really call it that, but of infinite love. I, I just felt madly in love with everything, with myself, with nature, with creation, with the trees, with the mountain, with the snow, with the cold, with, with everything. And I, I realized that I didn't need anything. I didn't mm. need anything to be happy. I just needed to be alive, that being alive was enough, that just being was enough and everything else was a bonus. Amazing. And so, and I actually met you a couple of months after that yes. <laughs> experience. And, you know, it was one of the most transformed things I've ever done. And, 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 you know, nobody necessarily has a time or the ability to take a month off, but, but everybody has the ability to take a day to do a 12 exactly. hour walk. And I think it's such a beautiful frame for how we start to re-meet ourselves and to reconnect with what matters and to re- think our lives and, and, and what comes out of that will be different for each of us, but it's a really a powerful frame for how to think about dealing with some of the really 
confusing and confronting and difficult and challenging things that we are facing today in the world that can make us really depressed and sad and hopeless and helpless. Uh, and, huh. and we all felt that during COVID. And that was your sort of way out of it was that 12 hour walk in the Oregon coast. But you know, I, I can't wait to go to Jackson Hole this summer and do a 12 hour walk and maybe just, we won't talk, but we can just walk and take a 12 hour walk. <laughs> no, absolutely. I mean, look, like it, it, you, you hit the nail on the head. Um, I, it, it's so powerful that you, that you went and did that for 30 days. I mean, that, that's incredible. That's a deep cut. You know, I've obviously my experience in Antarctica and I, I've done a few 10 day silent Vipassana meditation retreats, which have been really impactful for me. But it was beautiful to experience this 12 hour walk and why I'm so passionate about it. You know, I, I you are unique. Uh, you're unique in so many ways. That's why I love you so much. But you are unique in that you've done 30 days like that, that you've had the courage in your life to take that look inward. You know, I've asked this question to, to many people, uh, hundreds and hundreds of people at this point, which is in your in your in the last 10 years, you know, in your you know, whatever this phase of your life, what's the longest you've gone in solitude? Then I define that. I say um, sleeping doesn't count every time, you, <laughs> you know, so that doesn't count. So remove that every every time you check your phone, the clock resets. Every time someone talks to you, the clock resets. Every time you've got music or podcasts or television or whatever, the clock resets. Um, basically, anytime you have external inputs or when you're really focused on a task like you're doing, you're doing right. Um, the clock resets. And I've asked people, what's the longest you've gone? And the, the average answer to that question is somewhere between 30 minutes and an hour, like ever, wow. literally ever. It's just like, I, I, I don't do that. And unless somebody has a pretty deep spiritual practice, oh, I, I meditate for a couple hours or I've done this. I mean, it's, it's rare. Um, it's yeah. extremely rare. And this 12 hour walk is really meant to meet people anywhere uh, of any age. I mean, I've had uh, my 77 year old mother-in-law has done this 12 hour walk by engaging the silence and solitude. She walked one block, one, one time around her block. And then she sat for an hour on her front porch in silence and solitude, then walked another time around her block. So you don't have to be some crazy endurance athlete. This can meet you wherever you're at, but the exercise is more than the physicality. It's an exercise of the mind. It's actually to say, I need a reset. I need to look inward. And interesting what you experienced over those 30 days. Um, and I've seen people experience this in, in the 12 hours as well, which is those first few hours, your mind is the monkey mind. Your mind is like, oh my God, this, how am I going to get through this 12 hours? This is so long, you know, thinking about to-do lists or past grievances or fights yeah. with a spouse or whatever that, you know, the things that come up on the surface. But what's interesting is we're patterned to think that, that if it's this bad in this moment, it can only get worse. But what actually yeah. happens is, a slow quieting of this voice and an inner strength starts to build up. And that yeah. might come in ebbs and flows. Um, but what I've mostly found is people get back home and they feel incredibly empowered, incredibly strong. One of the core concepts that I talk about in the book, each chapter breaks down a common limiting belief we all face. So I don't, I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I'm not strong enough. Mm -hmm. What if I fail? Mm -hmm. What if people criticize me? And each, each chapter through rich storytelling and some prescriptive advice from my life, breaks each one of those down, how we can overcome it. But the overall concept is what I call, when you take the 12 hour walk, you cultivate what I call a possible mindset, uh, an empowered way of thinking that unlocks a life of limitless possibilities. Because I think we all yeah. have that inside of us. But to your point, we get bogged down. We get bogged down. It just like you did, you needed a reset, right? And this mm. is an offering to anybody, anywhere. You might have not have 30 days. You might not have 10 days for a Vipassana. But if this is a priority to you, the shift that you can have in one day by being alone yeah. in your thoughts, examining what's in there is deeply, deeply empowering. And uh, I'll offer one more thing, which is interesting that I found through, you know, uh, I'm no doctor, that's for sure. But through prescribing the 12 hour walk, so to speak, um, yeah. is people in this. Mo so you're listening to this podcast, let's say, and you're hearing about this 12 hour walk for the very first time. Usually where people's mind goes in some capacity starts to think, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? A, dis a decision tree is, is, is kind of coming. Is this interesting to me? Should I shouldn't do this? The 12 hour walk exercise, the walk itself is obviously the most powerful part of the exercise, but the exercise actually starts right now. And why do I say that? Because, because right now, as you're considering it, most likely anybody, this doesn't mean if you're the strongest person in the world, whatever, there's some limiting belief or series of limiting beliefs that are popping up right now. You're going, I'm listening to this podcast. This guy's talking about walking around in silence. I don't have <laughs> enough time for that. Shit. I don't have it. I don't have enough. You know, I, I, I'm not strong enough to do that. What if I fail? I mean, this is silly. What well, people will criticize me, whatever that is. What's mm -hmm. interesting is 
The 12 hour walk, even considering doing it is me holding up a mirror to you. I'm holding up a mirror to your own inner dialogue. And most likely if you are assigning some strong limiting beliefs to resisting to do the 12 hour walk, it's most likely that those same limiting beliefs are popping up in your mind over and over and over again as all sorts of things cross your path and maybe inhibit you from living your best life. So it's interesting when you do, you acknowledge those limiting beliefs, but you say, I'm still going to do the 12 hour walk. And when you do that, you get to the end and you go, I resisted doing this, but this was positive for me. And so therefore you look back on the next time those limiting beliefs pop up in your head because they happen to me. I'm not impervious to this either. I wrote a book about this, but I'm not impervious to that negative self-talk from time to time and go, oh, I've seen this thought pattern happen in my mind before, but I've shifted it and I took action. Therefore, how many other things can I do like this? And so the 12-hour walk ends up being this stand-in or this teacher um, through your own life to examine your own inner thoughts, overcome them, and then repeat that pattern as a ripple effect over time. It's true. I mean, it's one of the most powerful exercises I've ever done, which is to really take an honest, transparent look at my own thoughts. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. Prebiotics are like the compost you put on the ground to make the seeds grow. Mm. So it's really important to think of them together. And the polyphenols are like super fuel on all that stuff. And it's just a, it's a trifecta of a powerful set of comp-